grab a seat. Come on in from the outside. Let's get going. So, um, okay, we're ready to go. So this session, Debt, Jobs, and Growth, uh, tries to, we'll try to address the, really the core challenge that's facing both the United States and Europe right now, how to generate growth at a, a time of, uh, financial challenges as we have. Uh, we've got uh, a really first-rate panel for you, and we've asked uh, Anton uh, LaGuardia from The Economist to do the honors of moderating. So it's all yours. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a huge pleasure to be here, and it's a huge um, privilege to be able to uh, moderate uh, this panel. Um, starting from my right, we've got Stephen Van Acker, who's the uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Belgium and the Finance Minister. Uh, we've got uh, Mike, Congressman Mike Turner, Republican from Ohio. Uh, we've got William Port, who is a member of the Board of Management of Daimler. And uh, to the left, we've got Bob Hormatz, the Undersecretary for Economic Growth, Energy, the Environment of the State Department. It's a very long title, but um, you can do it in one breath. Um, uh, you know, for, for journalists like me who've been here for a year and a half, all we have really written about is the euro, the euro, the euro, uh, the crisis, and debt. Uh, and now, perhaps, uh, as the cover of The Economist puts it, uh, you know, we may just perhaps be glimpsing through the jungle uh, the glimmer of, uh, of the recovery. So I think that would probably be a good place to start. Uh, Mr. Van Acker, do we are we in a recovery? Has it started? You know, is it, uh, are we in the sunlit uplands of, uh, of the economy after all these um, terrible years? Well, I would like to, to say yes, and uh, I think I'm going to say yes. I know that a lot of people look at uh, the Belgian economy being a very open economy as one of the precursors, uh, precursors of uh, confidence rising again, uh, since uh, if, if the Belgians get a little bit more optimistic, probably it's because uh, the whole of the European Union uh, feels that uh, there is something undergoing. Now, I think that if we're going to look back at the crisis, probably we will identify that there has been a lot of irrational elements in the, in the crisis as well, and that confidence is one of the, the basic uh, elements that was missing at, uh, at one point, and perhaps that is still not there in, in enough amount. So, well, if you have a look at 2012 in, in my country, we're looking at uh, a, a 0 0.1 decrease in growth, so I cannot uh, say that uh, uh, growth is, uh, is very stimulative today, but I do see that confidence, as far as consumers, citizens and business is concerned, is moving on again. And I think that for the particular context of Belgium, that has a lot to do with the fact that after more than 500 days, finally, there has been a full-fledged government. Let's not forget that we handled the crisis, I think, pretty well, because uh, unemployment did not rise uh, as compared to 2008, during a 500-day caretaker government. But everybody knew that for the real fundamental uh, changes that we needed in, in order to get people working longer, uh, to make sure that there is a bigger participation to the labor uh, market, that there was a need for a full-fledged government. That government has taken measures for about 13 billion euro uh, to diminish the, the, de the deficit, that is more than 3% of our GDP, and people have seen, well, a, a little bit contradictory to the instincts, very often when there are measures that are being taken, you see that confidence goes down because people uh, feel that, uh, in a way, there are, uh, some of the, 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 the income is, is touched. Here, the, the opposite uh, occurred. Belgians apparently were waiting for a government to take the necessary measures, including measures that were not, also, not always uh, that uh, um, amusing for the people. Uh, uh, t telling to people that they had to work two years longer than what they expected is probably not the nicest message to give. But since they, they were waiting for that message, in a sense, confidence uh, got up uh, thanks to, to the presence of a, of a full-fledged government uh, the last 100 days. I'm going to interrupt you. There. Uh, Congressman, does it feel the same way in Ohio? The economy of Ohio, I believe, is roughly comparable to that of Belgium. Um, um, is it, are, you, are you feeling it? Are you feeling the recovery there? Are we, um, 
I, I would say the people in Ohio are not confident that a recovery is occurring. I mean, they certainly feel that there's been a, a, a period of stability, um, but they're not ser seeing uh, the job growth or the turnaround um, that, uh, that they would need in order to feel the confidence of an actual recovery. Uh, unemployment in my community is about 8%. Uh, areas of, of Ohio, it, uh, there are areas where it, it tops around 10%. Um, we've seen a significant job loss, and of course, in the manufacturing area, the mortgage foreclosure crisis had a huge impact uh, in the uh, housing markets in Ohio. Um, but overall, I think people are very concerned because they don't have the confidence uh, that uh, a recovery is imminent, uh, in part because they still see Washington uh, not getting uh, control over the, the uh, spending, uh, the debt uh, that, is, uh, that Washington is accumulating. Um, the, um, the debt panel that was put together uh, with the uh, uh, deal between uh, Congress and the President failed to come up with any recommendations to rein in spending. We still have trillion dollar deficits. People are looking to Washington to rein in spending. Then I think uh, they'll have uh, some confidence that the recovery is occurring. Energy prices also are of a great deal of concern. Okay. And um, Mr. Port, um, the German model, does it um, teach us, have lessons either for the rest of Europe or for, um, uh, or for the U.S.? Why, why is Germany doing so well, particularly manufacturing? I think there are a lot of elements you can really look at uh, for other countries too, but you need to adapt it to the, to the cultural environment. Uh, as we try to, to, to bring some of our uh, labor flexibility in our own company to our foreign subsidiaries, we found out that you know, legal framework, uh, uh, expectation from people is very different in the US than it is for in, in Germany or in other countries. Uh, but what really has so worked... Are you suggesting it's less flexible in the US than in Germany? No, it's different uh, flexibility. Your hire and fire is there, I would say, a, a more accepted uh, tool of flexibility where this is not accepted at all in, in Europe, especially in Germany. So you want to have a higher safety net and this is why we have different ways of using flexibility. You know, time accounts, flexible time accounts, uh, uh, time, um, fl uh, also this uh, short time working uh, scheme with the government. Uh, so we have different uh, measures, uh, but all those elements together, they really uh, helped us very much through the crisis. And now it's helping us also in the, in the growth uh, scenarios. Uh, this is why uh, I think... You mean you managed to retain the skills through the downturn? We retained the skills and we also we, we banked a little bit of or a lot of hours, which we now can use in the, gro in the growth scenario without hiring too many additional people, without qualifying too many additional people. Uh, so we are very, uh, very fast and flexible in reacting now to the growth side as we have reacted to the downside. Bob, what um, you, you know, in a sense, you, you look at the whole world economy from, from, your, from your seat at, at the State Department. Um, how, how does it look to you? I mean, the sort of growth in Asia is so much sort of faster and more dynamic than in the, in the Western countries, be it in America or in Europe, slower in Europe than in America, obviously. Uh, you know, is this a, a time of economic decline for, for all of us? Well, I think from the point of view of what we're trying to do, I've just come from Asia, from Vietnam and from uh, Thailand, and you do get uh, a, a more optimistic view of the future when you look at the world from Asia's point of view as opposed to from Europe or the United States. On the other hand, I think what's, what's important and, and the way we look at this now is, first of all, that and you look at the title of this, Debt, Jobs, and Growth. There are ways of creating jobs and growth that don't depend on fiscal stimulus in an aggregate sense. Mm -hmm. And those require structural changes mm -hmm. in the labor markets, in the way we invest our money. Not all money is the same. Wisely invested money is different from non-wisely invested money in terms of its impact on, on growth and jobs. For instance, Germany has done very well with Kurzarbeit. In other words, people, when the, the economy is down, people are retained, then they keep their labor skills. One of the big problems we have in the West is unemployment, particularly youth unemployment, and we need to find better ways of improving our labor markets and doing things like apprentice programs to keep people in the labor game, even during periods of downturn. This is socially important and economically important. The second thing is when we do spend money, spend it wisely, which means things like infrastructure. And I, I do think from an, an American point of view, the president's made these proposals. If you look at Asia, one of the reasons their economies are doing well, obviously they're lower wages, but they've spent a lot of money in building their infrastructure, which has made them far more competitive. 
A third way is trade. Trade is a way of increasing jobs and growth, uh, trade across the Atlantic, but other kinds of trade agreements. If, for instance, they're ambitious, and second, that they're enforced properly. You just can't make deals. You have to make sure that they're, that they're enforced. So I think there are a great many ways in which even in a period of fiscal consolidation that we have today, or at least uh, trying to hold down budget deficits or reverse them, there are a number of things that can be done to create jobs, mostly of a structural nature. The Asians, I think, have, have understood this. Germany has done particularly well among Western countries, but other countries in, in Northern Europe have, have done the same. There's a lot we can learn about how to use this current time. In the United States, one example is during the Civil War, when we spent huge amounts of money, had huge deficits paying for the war, we built the Transcontinental Railway at the same time. If you look at Thailand, they had a huge financial problem, 97, 98. They learned from it. They decided, well, now we have to do better to make ourselves more competitive. They built an excellent infrastructure. So there are ways in which you can both consolidate fiscal policy and produce growth. It just has to be done in a more sophisticated fashion. Let me just pick up one thing before we open it up to questions, because I really do want to get you guys involved as much as more than listening to me, uh, but just to sort of uh, warm us up. Um, on this question of uh, austerity versus stimulus, when, you know, when is the right time to bring down the deficit? How fast do you try and bring down debt? Uh, we've got this transatlantic debate where the Europeans are accused of going too hard, too fast down the road of consolidation, of having a sort of coordinate, you know, sort of almost provoking a coordinated uh, uh, downturn as a result of this. On the other hand, in the US, you have, as you heard the congressman saying, you know, we've still got too much debt and deficit. We're not going fast enough. How, how, do, how, how do you look at this, this balance, um, well, Mr. Vanakko? I think, in a way, markets didn't leave us a lot of choice. I, I do agree that, uh, at one point, if you take into account the, the deficits of the European Union member countries and you compare it, for example, with the deficit in the United States, then you, you wonder why, why everybody is uh, tapping on our, on our back. And it is true that for some countries, have a look at what Spain has to do. They're at 8.5% uh, deficit today. They, they would like to be at 3% in two years' time. That's a tremendous amount uh, of effort. Uh, on the other hand, I think that uh, uh, by now, after having settled the, the settled, here mark my words, but the Greek situation has been settled as far as the, the, the initiatives that needed to be taken. But when we say in 2020, Greece should be at a level where the debt ratio is at 120%, then we are saying this with the expectations of growth figures or GDP real figures that uh, are exactly the same in 2020 as in 1996. What is that of an ambition? That is not an ambition. It cannot be an ambition to say in Greece the growth or at least the production of wealth will be in 2020 at the level of 1996. So I think that in order to be credible towards the financial markets, the, the, the orthodoxy, the, the, the prudence that has been used in a lot of estimation has been that exaggerated that in a sense probably there will be a, a relativization afterwards. But simply we did not have a choice. In my country in November interest rates were almost at 6% and we were looking at our colleagues of Portugal and Spain and, and wondering are we heading at a double digit uh, interest rate? Three months later now we are at 3.2%. The spreads has, have, have dropped dramatically. So is that every, does this have to do with the new Minister of Finance? No. No. <laughs> I will say it differently when, I, uh, when I'm on campaign, but uh, <laughs> it does not have to do with, with the Minister of Finance. It has to do with the, not only confidence coming back, but people looking at the fundamentals again. So I in a sense, I, I very much agree with, with the logic of let's have a look at how without spending money or spending it wisely, how we can do uh, a lot of things. And I think one of the ideas that I would like to share and subscribe to, do, did, do we know, European and uh, American friends, do we know that if we would take away the non-tariff barriers of trade between yeah the Atlantic, that this would be worth almost $160 billion a year? Absolutely. So, and, and what does it cost? What does it cost not to have all these tremendous non-tariff barriers? I'm not talking about money. Yeah. I'm talking about rendering life difficult for our businesses and, and simply saying, let's get rid of it. And I do agree as well with the argument that uh, since we have shared interests in the world economy, 
taking care of implementation of the, the things that we uh, think are important, for example, the protection of intellectual property rights, these are things where we should go jointly to the other economies to say, we, re we absolutely desperately need this because protectionism is not the solution. This is a great opportunity for Europe and the United States to work together on a wide range of things, expanding trade between us, which requires reducing barriers behind the border, regulations, standard setting, doing them in a coherent and, and collective way. And second, making sure that we together have the highest standards in the world, which would open up markets on both sides of the Atlantic and set high standards that we then try to export to other countries. So that instead of this nationalistic balkanization of standards, which we see in China and Latin America and other places, we have one set of efficient global standards and we can be the standard setters that can expand trade between us, which creates jobs and also make for a more efficient global economy so that our companies are not put at disadvantages in trying to sell to third markets that have these much more restrictive sets of, of, uh, of measures. Is that the kind of help that uh, you think is important for, for man big manufacturers like yourself? I, I'm with everyone here on the panel when we say we need to, we need to stand, now we need to accept global standards in order to avoid you know, extra cost and investments for developing different standards for different countries, yeah, which, which at the end of the day is not really uh, an, an added value for the customer. Uh, but we also should be very careful that we don't have a competition of governments in raising standards to levels and uh, to, you know, uh, also in time frames where companies are not able anymore to recover the invested yeah. money. And that's actually really happening at the moment in the automotive industry, you know. We need to increase our uh, CO, no, we need to decrease our CO2 levels in, uh, in, in, in very short term. We need to introduce elect electric mobility. We need to introduce you know, hybrid vehicles and everything to the market. But finally, the customer is not yet prepared to pay for that. And the governments are not yet prepared to subsidi uh, subsidize that in the way, if we want to change the society, then we need, to, we need to invest there too. If we don't do that, companies will not be able to recover the investment. And this is where I say, yes, standards, but please stop this uh, you know, competition about, you know, we have the highest standard and the next one says we have an even higher standard. Now, that will kill economy. Uh, on your question of the issue of, of austerity versus spending, I mean, one thing that we have to understand that, that's important in the discussion that, that's happening up here is that um, government doesn't create jobs. Government creates an environment in which jobs can be created um, and, the, and can encourage that yeah, environment. Well, once in a while in my country, yes. there are some jobs created by government. I, <laughs> but, but, but they're not, but they're not sustainable. Yeah, they're I know, not I know, I know. <laughs> that, I that is not a, su a sustainable market. Point well taken. <laughs> the, um, the government, um, in taking from an existing economy, either in taxes or by either borrowing, taking capital from, from uh, an existing economy, um, still has a, an overall responsibility in, in spending that is shaking, I think, the confidence of, of businesses for moving forward. Certainly in the United States, people are looking to Washington to give them the confidence that government can live within its means and can reign in spending. When you look at the indicators of what's happening in our economy, even if there are encouraging indicators, when they look at the overall bottom line of what's happening in spending, they're looking at Washington to, 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 to rein that in. Um, the, but there are ways. And you ways. would do that in, sort of rein in now as opposed to rein in when the recovery has taken hold? We have to. We're, we're generating trillion dollar deficits. Uh, the United States has an overall um, you know, d d uh, national debt that it's equivalent to our economy. This, this cannot be sustained. Everyone knows that it cannot be sustained. So they're looking for responsible government to come in and say, you know, we're going to take that lever and we're going to pull it back. Um, now, in creating the environment in which jobs uh, can, can thrive. You know, these are the important discussions of, well, when there is going to be spending, where should it be spent? Infrastructure, as was being discussed, is a certainly an important area. But also in the areas of, you know, what can we do to, to um, encourage businesses to thrive? Trade is an area where um, certainly, I think, uh, both in the United States and in Europe, we have an interest in whether or not um, fair trade practices are, uh, are are pursued and, and our businesses are protected from unfair competition. It's an area that we were discussing uh, before that I think is, is one where we can work together. We're both in um, intellectual uh, property uh, and uh, product dumping are areas where uh, Europe and the United States can work together to try to uh, ensure that our businesses are subject to fair competition. Okay, I think we should open it up. Uh, yeah, okay, please. Uh, just hold on for the microphone. I'm told everyone has to have a microphone before they speak. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Okay. Uh, my name is Paula Stern, and I'd like to connect uh, the German Marshall Fund to the discussion today um, uh, with regard to the U.S.-European free trade agreement notion. I don't like the FTA idea. I like the, the, the uh, better word than that. But Bob has uh, put that on the table as a great opportunity. Um, it's uh, one, however, that we are... Uh, I'd like to get your re reaction to. In May, uh, the G8 is going to be spe uh, meeting. Um, I think it's a very important opportunity for the U.S. and its leadership at the highest level, and Europe, the EU, uh, and its member states uh, that are at the G8 at its highest levels to signal that this is an opportunity to reap the benefits um, and, and start, if you will, the ball rolling with tariff eliminations, uh, then move on to NTB. And I mean, you can pace this thing uh, and, and ultimately get the, the kind of uh, uh, partnership that we need vis-a-vis -vis China when it comes to standard settings, et cetera. But now is the time. I understand it's an election year in the United States, but this is Europe and the U.S., and we have, in Europe would say, even higher standards than the United States from the point of view of any of those who in the United States would fear a, a new trade agreement. Okay. Um, I'd like your reaction because um, I think we could galvanize something here. Thank you very much for that thought. I'm going to take a couple more. And I'm going to urge you all, please, to be as brief as you can. We obviously want to hear what you have to say, but we also want to give as many people the opportunity to intervene. Yeah, please. Thanks. Giles Merritt, uh, Friends of Europe, Brussels Think Tank. I, I couldn't help getting the impression from all of the panelists that you think that we're going to go back to where we were before the crisis started. And when I look at Europe and I look at the competitiveness problems I, overall, and I look at demography. I just wonder, I'd like to ask, do you think we're going to go back to where we were? Okay, and one more. Uh, where's the microphone? Why don't you give the microphone here? I'll come back. I think at the last European Council meeting, there was a new recognition that uh, growth is um, as important as uh, austerity. And we've heard about the challenge of combining fiscal consolidation with stimulation. Infrastructure projects, yes, if the money were available, but alas, it's not for now. Just before the last European Council, 12 prime ministers uh, wrote a letter to uh, Mr. Van Rompuy and to Mr. Barroso urging initiatives in one area that could stimulate growth and jobs, namely uh, services and the digital agenda. Oh, there are still talking about barriers between the United States and Europe. There are still many barriers within Europe in these areas and a tremendous potential that could be released. There was scarcely a trace of this issue in the conclusions of the European Council. I'd like to ask Mr. Van Acker in particular if he thinks this could be a way forward. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I don't, uh, please feel free to answer as many or as few questions as interest you. Um, shall we take, start from the right? Well, three short ideas for three questions. First, you say now is the time. Well, now would be the time if we weren't that grim in our expectations about Doha. <laughs> Let's be fair. I think that a, a, a set of bilateral agreements is something that is always to be wished. But it is to be wished because apparently the multilateral framework today is, is, is nowhere, or at least is, is somewhere where it's not going, uh, going forward. And I'm not sure that uh, we can be too optimistic about uh, getting Doha on track uh, quite, quite easily. And I think it is necessary, especially in order to uh, be able as a, as a unity, let me tell this in, in that fashion, uh, to, uh, to be able on the standards issue to reconnect with the logic in which most of the time it were our uh, people and our businesses that were deciding the standard because there has been talk about competition of standards but the, the, the big bother is it's not going to be our standard. That is the big bother. It's going to be somebody else's standard at one point. And then are we going, coming back to, to where we come from? No, because one of the words that unfortunately hasn't been mentioned yet is innovation. 
we, we didn't talk a lot about that. And uh, when it comes to infrastructure in a country like Belgium, where we think that we pretty much have all the infrastructure that we need, because as, as a logistics hubs, uh, I think Belgium is one of the most favored countries. But the real infrastructure is, of course, the talent of the people and the educational system. And the, the guarantee that being innovative is not something that is God given. You have to work on it uh, every generation again. So I think that coming back to the, the former situation, no, never, because the demographics, the demographics changes not only the, the, the macroeconomic uh, environment, but also the societal environment. When von Bismarck invented pension, the average age, life expectancy of the German worker was 43 years of age. It was an insurance against the absurd risk that somebody would keep on living uh, while he did not work. Huh? Today, that is completely different. You should, there's one of my favorite authors of science fiction is John Wyndham. And John Wyndham described the society in which everybody gets to be 140 years old. And he asks himself, if you get to be 140 years old, do you stay married with the same woman for a, do you stay with the same employer? And he, he asks all, all these tremendously interesting questions, but it is true that gradually, we're moving on, and we have to change also our view about careers, so we cannot go back to the, 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 the former situation. And then to, to your question, I, I think with my accent on innovation and educational system, I already answered a little bit uh, on that question. And I think, and Cathy won't hold it against me that I say that, very often when we hear the European Union say to the member states, you should develop uh, uh, growth strategies, EU 2020, etc., as if it is I know it's not meant like that, but as if it is a dictation to the 27 member countries, very often a country like Belgium says, but there is a 28th actor in that. But unfortunately, the budget of the European Union, and I'm speaking like a Belgian, Belgian now, the budget of the European Union is 1%. Even a slim federal state in the United States is, well, 20-fold. Uh, I think that the, the, the percentage of... Um, the budget of the, the federal uh, state in the US is uh, in GDP is about 20, 23, 25, I don't know exactly, but it's 1% in, in, in Europe. So this 28th actor, which is the European Union itself, should have more leeway in order to, to uh, uh, give impulsions to, to growth. Okay, thank you very much. You, two questions on trade and one question on whether we're going back to where we were. Does, who wants to oh, one, come in? One of the things yeah. that I think uh, is important about the, the concept of, of ingenuity and where are we going back to and, and government's intervention. Um, you know, the, the ingenuity really is what, what drives the economy of the future. When we look at issues like, for example, the iPad, who would have thought five years ago that how uh, uh, changed our economy is going to be both in services, um, in, uh, in opportunity for uh, writing programming and, and applications and even use uh, and efficiencies that, that, that come from that technology that really don't, it doesn't come from government, it comes from ingenuity, but creating that environment in order to be able to, to uh, support that type of ingenuity. Are trade deals, just on, pick up on specific questions on trade, are trade deals f feasible in an election year? Well, I mean, you know, certainly... The, and is they, it easier with Europe than with anybody else? I, I, think, I think certainly in, in an environment, especially in the United States, in the, of the elections that we're currently having, having everything is more difficult. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, the, um, and I think, I think we're all seeing that, that play itself out. But with respect to trade, I think that you know, it's not just the issue, as we've been discussing up here, of new trade agreements. It's actually looking to fair trade and enforcing the, the uh, trade agreements that we have, looking at uh, non-tariff trade barriers, uh, looking at intellectual property protection, uh, looking at product dumping. I mean, those are things that, that really erode uh, the security of our economy the, certainly has, a, has had a huge impact in Ohio in, in the areas of, of manufacturing, where it's not an issue of, of free trade, it's an issue of losing jobs over a lack of fair trade. Uh, that, I think, is something that we can put ourselves to uh, in any time, not even, even in an election year, uh, that uh, I think we all have insight into. Mr. Port, do you worry most about external barriers to trade, internal barriers to trade, or loss of intellectual property and expertise? Well, 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 which of these issues gets you? Depends on the countries. <laughs> but I would like to go back. One key word here is competitiveness, because the whole business success depends at the end on, on competitiveness. And we have at the moment in Europe a big disbalance of competitiveness. And uh, so we will never go back, hopefully not, never go back into the pre-crisis uh, mode, uh, because that was one underlying problem of Europe. 
So what we need to do is we need to work on the frame conditions in the different countries, and we need to work a lot on, on education and qualification. Because if you talk about technology, what we need is we need a lot of people who are able to develop those new technologies. And at the moment, uh, we are really getting into trouble uh, to get enough young people going for those universities and for those uh, subjects which will help us to develop the future technologies. And we need to stimulate at school, we need to stimulate the young people to really go for that. Uh, for that. Uh, and there are some f uh, frameworks around uh, labor regulations uh, which are you know, contradictory between the European Union opinion and uh, framework setting and the local uh, in the countries. And we need to sort that out because otherwise uh, we are starting to weaken the strong ones uh, instead of strengthening the weak ones because we need to have a very strong competitiveness uh, to, at the end to, to compete with the world. What do, you, what do you mean by that? I mean, in what way are the strong ones being weakened? Yeah, there's a lot of criticism in, in, uh, for the Germans to say we have not raised the salaries in the same amount others have done. This is why we have artificially reduced uh, basically the labor cost. Yeah? But when you look at uh, different factors, you find out that's not really true because we have really increased the efficiency in our uh, industry a lot. Um, and uh, this is why, and, and we have a lot of uh, labor rules, or labor regulations, which really helped us to, to stay competitive. All right, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that, yes. A couple of points. One on the question, can we go back to where we were? The answer is emphatically no, we can't. Um, the, the old model in the U.S. was essentially uh, to uh, undersave um, and overconsume based on borrowing. That was a non-sustainable model. The second part of that is uh, that we also underinvested uh, quite dramatically and undersaved. So the, the model itself has to change very considerably from, you know, uh, from essentially overconsumption, overborrowing in an unsustainable way. We have to place more emphasis on investment, the right kind of investment, and a higher savings rate. That's certainly something we can't go back to the old model. And other countries have similar paradigms that have to, have to change as well. The second element which requires uh, a difference is, is innovation and change. More and more new products are being developed. We have conversations with the Europeans on e-mobility, which is electronic cars, smart grids, e-health, nanotechnology, a wide range of other things where we and the Europeans can work together. And third, we have to change because there are new th uh, threats to us or new challenges from very state-driven economic models, which place a lot of emphasis on state enterprises which get uh, enormous subsidies uh, and artificial benefits from their governments that compete with private sector companies. And also, uh, there are protectionist measures to support those state enterprises which put our companies at a big disadvantage. We in the Europeans share a view that we have to be much more assertive in addressing those kinds of issues, because it's not just that we're competition competing against individual products, we're competing against different models of economic growth, and we have to make sure our economic model is successful and provide an example to the rest of the world. The second point is Paula's point. I do think this is an opportunity for uh, expanding trade opportunities as well. Um, I, I take the point that whatever we do definitely has to be uh, enforced properly, otherwise we will have no credibility in any future negotiation at all. But I don't think the argument that we, that because Doha is not going anywhere for the moment, we have to stop the process of liber liberalization. There are many fronts on which liberalization can take place. And it needn't always be free trade agreements. It can be freer trade agreements where we reduce barriers behind the, the, the tariff walls. It's not so much tariffs that are the problem between the US and Europe. It's a lot of non-tariff barriers or restrictions. We can reduce or eliminate a lot of those. That will create a lot of jobs across the Atlantic and also gives us more credibility when we go after third countries. And that is going to be a big problem because the big challenge for the US and Europe is not the US or Europe. It is third country models. We have to realize they're going to play a bigger role in the global system, but we want them, in effect, to buy into global market rules. Now, they may have their ideas for changing rules somewhat, but we know that market-oriented rules, which reduce the role of governments in, in economies and give more uh, opportunity for private initiative, has, have, have worked. 
So the question is, can we get these countries to understand that? I actually think that China will begin to move in that direction because their state enterprises are quite inefficient. They misuse capital. So even there, there are changes. But I think we need to underscore that our model works and make it work, and then it becomes leadership by example. Minister wants to jump in quickly. Sorry, hang on a sec. One of our desires Sorry. is to try to get by the G8 meeting at least some positive signals, if not a, a definitive uh, conclusion to our talks. But let's make as much movement between the US and Europe between now and May as we possibly can. Okay. The Minister, comment, the small comment I quickly. would like to make is that uh, in this roundup of the, the engines of change, I think we are losing track of uh, one fourth explanation, which is the M word of migration or mobility. Uh, we're talking about we have to change as if the economies are completely stable, and but people are doing the, the moving for us. Uh, if you listen to the news that in Portugal today, a lot of people are choosing to go elsewhere because they see their the future. Mozambique. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, I think if we're not careful about it or we, if we do not integrate that in our into our analysis, the change is going to be made for us through people moving much more than was possible a century or two centuries ago. And uh, if you look at human history, always change has also come about by people changing. It has created, yeah. it has created your country. Uh, and in that sense, I think that mobility of people uh, and uh, the, the, the moving of people is, is an element that we should not forget. It's not just mobility across borders, it's upward mobility in our own countries. Yes. That, the critical element of democracy is upward mobility. People who can, you, they're immigrants in one generation and their sons and daughters are doctors or lawyers or others in the, in the next generation. That upward mobility internally is vitally important to economic success and to the stability and progress of democracies. Okay, let's hear some more questions. Um, yes, please. I'm Philippe Debuc, Director General of Business Europe, representing the European business uh, uh, community. Uh, just to reinforce what was said uh, and what you said, sir, uh, <clears throat> we just come back from Washington, yeah. where we had a meeting with all the business organizations in yes. your country, uh, asking together for, call it a free trade, for, call it a comprehensive partnership agreement, and a clear signal between now and uh, the G8 meeting, not in the G8, but along the G8. And I think if that could happen, uh, this would be a great success. And it's not against uh, Doha or the WTO. We as Business Europe are perhaps the most larger supporter of the WTO because we want rule-based uh, trade, but it is because it would create an example also. And my last point, as Cathy Ashton is in the room. Uh, we really want to have at the European level the support of the diplomats. Uh, we need to have an economic diplomacy where when we discuss with China, with India, with Russia and with all the others, that we have a common view supporting the business development because market access is a key element. Thank you. Okay, the next one, please. Uh, I'm, I'm Harlan Ullman. My question has to do with um, unintended consequences. Uh, in 1908, credit default swaps were made illegal in the United States following the 1907 financial crisis. And 91 years later, in the dark of night, they were legalized with some interesting effects. Uh, I was curious to know whether you regard the uh, European Central Bank release of some trillion euros in long-term repo options, LTRs, as something that's going to be beneficial, or is this going to prove to be a ticking time bomb? Okay, and there's one here. And Danny Gross, Center for European Policy Studies. I will resist the temptation to comment on the ticking time bomb. Um, I wanted to come back to this idea of a transatlantic partnership of free trade area. I've been around in Brussels for quite some time. And this is one of these hardy perennials which pops up at almost every recession. And it never gets anywhere beyond symbolic gestures. Why? There's a fundamental reason. It doesn't really make much sense. If there's one area where there's very little trade barriers left, it's the transatlantic area, right? And the small differences that exist may be worth attacking, but the real differences are differences in national regulatory frameworks. And when you think about it, the always the question comes back down to, are the legislators on both sides of the Atlantic 
ready to abdicate their sovereignty to set national regulatory standards to protect their consumers. Question to congressmen, would Congress be willing to say, we no longer have a competence in this area, this will be done at the transatlantic framework? Same thing for the European Parliament. I think the answer is always in the end, no. Wouldn't it be much better if you think about those areas where there are significant barriers left, namely with the emerging markets? And here there's one thing that hasn't been mentioned today, but it's very interesting, which is cooking, but at a very small flame, which is this free trade agreement potentially between India and the EU. That would be a game changer because that's an area where there's huge trade barriers left. Wouldn't it be more uh, efficient, for, at least for the EU, to concentrate on opening markets with these emerging partners rather than trying a futile game of a more symbolic uh, initiative with the United States? Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, free trade deal with America, yes or no? Useful, useless? Uh, and, uh, and the question on uh, CDSs. Uh, who wants to start? Go. Yeah, I, I, I think you've conflated several things, and let me try to sort them out. One, it's not a question either or. Um, you can have progress with Europe and progress with emerging economies. I quite agree progress with emerging economies is important. Second, I completely disagree with the notion that lowering barriers between the United States and Europe is not a significant thing. It is a very significant thing. Trade between the United States and Europe is the largest single trading relationship in the world by far. So even a minor change in regulations is, can be very helpful in job creation. Third point, uh, I totally agree that it is very difficult and has proved to be very difficult because there are regulators who pride their regulations and don't want to change them for all sorts of national reasons. But it's not because of a fundamental disagreement on safety of consumer protection. We both agree with that. The US and Europe both agree with that. There are different modalities, different ways of doing it. In many cases, not all, but many, there are ways of harmonizing them or having mutual recognition which can actually free up opportunities. And even a small margin of change in a few areas can lead to very substantial improvements in trade. It's not about tariffs. And as I say, whether it's a free trade agreement or not, to me, uh, you, one can argue either way. But liberalization, particularly on standard setting and, and regulations, can be helpful and is doable. We share the same objectives. How we achieve those objectives has been a matter of difference. And I think those differences can be resolved with some substantial benefits as a result from both sides. Do you have like a specific or two examples sure, of, I'll give you four of them? Um, two will do. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> one, I'll give you two. Um, one of which is uh, electronic cars. We've actually made a lot of progress on this, and and I think your point is right. It can't be, despite companies. Companies have to be part of it. And one of the things we've been able to do is to have really good working groups under the tech on, uh, on electronic cards, both and in interconnectivity, smart grids, a whole range of things. It's not dramatic progress, but it's a lot more progress than I would have thought a year ago. And companies and regulators and members of Congress have been very intimately involved in this. The second one is electronic health records. In the United States, under current legislation, uh, uh, hospitals and doctors have to have electronic health um, uh, records over the course of the next several years to qualify for certain Medicare benefits. Um, and the advantage here is that once we get the technologies right on both sides, it's a new technology so that setting common standards is easier. When you have old things, the regulators become entrenched. When you have some of these new technologies, there's a little bit more flexibility in the regulatory convergence. Uh, area and we think e-health is a, a very good opportunity, not ju just so that patients in the U.S. can get treated and when they go to Europe and vice versa. It's because doctors don't write very clearly sometimes. People can't read their prescriptions. It's if you go to a hospital, you want to have those records online so the hospital can get them, avoids hospital mistakes. And third, it's just much more efficient for the system. And we can do these kinds of, of areas of regulatory cooperation, which opens the market for uh, a whole series of companies that want to trade in e-health products across the Atlantic. Mr. Turner, can you see negotiating not only with your co 
colleagues in Congress, but with European politicians as well? Well, I mean, first off, you, you answered your question when you were asking it, that of course, no, the United States Congress and certainly I think uh, you know, our European partners, no one's going to want to just concede uh, the, the responsibility for, for regulatory uh, uh, you know, aspects of the economy, protecting consumers. Government has an important job to do. Certainly that's one where you know, the, the populaces of our, our various countries hold us accountable for if we're doing our, our job in that area. But there is a significant amount of dialogue that, that, that can occur. And one of the issues that, that we've been, been talking about here, obviously, is how we can work together to, to open even other markets. You know, when we look to issues of um, trade barriers in China, uh, the ability for us to trade and being subjected to unfair trade practices of products coming from China, you know, that's an area where we could have a joint dialogue, where we both have shared information and shared goals that could make a huge difference in opening markets for products uh, from um, you know, both regions and uh, certainly could make a, uh, a, a great partnership uh, for economic growth. How do you feel about politicians setting regulations <laughs> while you're trying to innovate at the same time? Is there a risk of, of stifling innovation if, if standards are set? too early and too rigidly. We need to be more and more careful about, you know, is, is the standard or is the regulation influencing the solution, the technical solution? Because if, if that is happening, then uh, we will not have innovation anymore. So we need to be careful about the uh, giving enough free space for the engineers in this world to define the, uh, the right solution uh, for the technology. But I would like to jump quickly into the trade agreement issue. We, we fully support the, the, um, the US-European trade agreement, but we also, and I agree with you, we need to focus on the, uh, on the emerging markets very much. So uh, we at, uh, as Daimler, you know, we have created 14,000 new jobs last year, 40% uh, of them in our European locations, but 80% based on emerging market volumes. So we need those new markets uh, also to increase our jobs uh, in, uh, in our traditional locations. Uh, and for that, we need a, a proper framework of, of trade. So I, I think it's, as you said, it's not the one and then we have done it. We need both. Yeah. Yeah. And, we're, and we're really pushing a lot on the emerging markets. I mean, we have a lot going on with China, not a free trade agreement, but a lot of areas of intellectual property protection, level playing field, state enterprises versus private sector companies. Uh, we have similar dialogues with India. We've just completed three FTAs with South Korea, Colombia, Panama. So we're open. We're, we'd like to do more on some of these emerging markets because that is where the growth is. And uh, but it's not either or. And, and in fact, one reason we're talking about Europe is because the argument has been that we've been focusing a lot on emerging economies. Now there's some benefits to be derived from progress on Europe also. Minister, do you want to all jump the in? the same thing. There is no contradiction in wanting to have a strong transatlantic, uh, knowing that uh, the, the fascination that everybody has for the double-digit double growth in, in some emerging markets should not make us forget that the bulk of economic inter interaction today on this planet is still uh, between the transatlantic, and there is a lot to be gained also in uh, non-tariff barriers. I, I mentioned the figure of $160 billion per year, and I, th I happen to think that that is not a not a, a, a small amount of money. Um, I, met, I, I saw that everybody uh, uh, skipped the question on, on ECB, probably thinking that the finance minister was going to speak about ECB. Well, that's not going to happen because <laughs> <laughs> I happen to believe that uh, the logic of uh, uh, respecting the autonomy and uh, the independence of that institution is very important, especially for a finance minister. I must, I must, I must say that um, Finance ministers love, lo love to talk about the ECB when people aren't listening. Um, uh, okay, let's have another round of questions. Yeah, Nick. Uh, Nick Gowing, um, debt, jobs and growth, isn't there one critical word missing here? Skills. Because you've talked about mobility. It's all very well having unemployment, but at the moment there's a big mismatch between unemployment and the skills available to fill those jobs. I think manpower say there are at least three million unfillable jobs in Europe at the moment. And the number of companies who've got cash, who want to invest, who want to expand, but can't fill the jobs because of skills. I come from a country where uh, Obviously, there are the coalition has, has made a decision about migration and immigration, and it's now becoming much more difficult with India because we're now deciding, or the government has decided, that uh, fewer migrants should come into the country, creating at least greater flexibility within the country. That's what they believe. Mm -hmm. I'd like to put to you that, therefore, there's the word skills, but also migration, not just mobility. OK. 
Okay, uh, the lady over there. Thank you, Almut Müller, German Council on Foreign Relations. Um, Minister van Acker, I would like to ask you, after having spent so many years uh, uh, already in, in meetings under great stress with uh, your European uh, colleagues, you talked about confidence just now. Where would you, how would you rate the level of confidence amongst your European colleagues, in particular those within uh, the Eurozone. I mean, there are some countries that have reason to be more confident. Uh, Germany is certainly one example for now, but other countries have more reason for concern. So after two years of this great stress of a lack of probably increasing lack of trust of the European Union citizens, especially the young ones, do you feel amongst your colleagues that they are agreeing on we're going down the right way, we can bridge the increasing gaps and we essentially get out of the stronger because we have the energy to do what you suggested needs to be done, which is not going back to the past, but creating something new. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the lady here. <coughs> Mia Dornert, a Belgian newspaper columnist. The congressman used the word uh, manufacturing, and I was struck by reading comments in American newspapers that countries with a strong manufacturing base weathered the crisis better than countries with a kind of financial capitalism. So I have two questions. Innovation is extremely important, but I think it's important to tell young people that innovation is not just a new iPad or that kind of thing, that people still need shoes and tables and lots of things where you have to be innovative. And there's a small example in Belgium, there's a company which makes playing cards, you know, to play bridge or whist or some, because people still play those games. And they're doing very well because they've been very innovative. So I think maybe it's good to give young people an ambition that you can be innovative in making shoes or clothes or, or whatever, and not just that sector, that's one thing. And then secondly, more general, isn't it important to have a, st a stimulus to retain a manufacturing base because that is a sector which creates solid jobs, very diverse jobs, and, and which pay better than mo many of the precarious jobs which have been created in the new economy. Thank you very much. There's a question at the back. Uh, John Richardson, the German Marshall Fund. Uh, uh, Minister Van Acker had talked about the assets we have in our, in our people in Europe. Uh, the, the unemployment rate hovers around 10%, but with young people under the age of 25, it's on average 20%. And that figure has risen to 30% in Ireland and in Portugal, it's 45% in Greece, it's 49% in Spain. And I have a question for the two Europeans on the panel. For Mr. Port, is there anything which big successful companies in Europe can do to make better use, more use of these unused assets? And for the minister, is this politically acceptable, this situation? How long can it go on? And if not, can you conceive of a European Union initiative to specifically tackle it? Or would you recommend them all to emigrate to Mozambique and the United States? Or Germany. Um, okay, so we've had a, I'm gonna stop there for a second, otherwise we'll forget the question. We've had a question on, my, on migration and skills. We've had a question on uh, the importance of manufacturing. Uh, and what do we do about unemployment? If I can summarize some very good points. Why don't we start with you on, um, on the importance of manufacturing? I think you can see that very clearly, you know. Uh, you need manufacturing, uh, and, and Germany is, I think, the most industrialized state still in, uh, in Europe with around 25%, whereas uh, UK, France on a very low level. Um, that this is very important for the uh, stability of the society too, not only for, for the job creation and technology and so on, but also very much so for, for the stability. There may be a correlation, is it a causation? Why is manufacturing essential to a country's economy? It gives a lot of people who, who or don't want or who have not been qualified for, for jobs which are out, you know, they want to work with their hands, with their, with, with, yeah, with, with, with their natural, no, brain is also natural skill, but I would say more with their, with their hands and not so much, uh, you know, go into service area, they might not be really qualified for that. And uh, so one reason for the, for the disbalance in, in, uh, at our universities in education system is that it was obviously very uh, interesting or very attractive for young people to, to become an investment banker. So that has changed now. Uh, hopefully a little bit, but uh, the world would, could not live only on investment banking. So we need to, to rebalance this uh, in our education system. 
And, I think if I could and just, I just, can I just want to ask one more question just while we're on the point? I mean, on, on the question of manufacturing jobs, I mean, one of the big issues in France, for example, and elsewhere, is the question of jobs moving offshore to cheaper parts of Europe. Uh, in a sense, Germany has, you know, German manufacturers have, have made a success of, you know, that global, that global supply chain, but um, it doesn't, it's hard to sell to voters sometimes, isn't it? It is, and I, I think we need to be careful not, uh, you know, uh, pu or pushing the bars too high in order, because this will take further industrial jobs out of, out of Europe. And one issue was about the young people in Spain and, and what can we do with those young people, uh, especially the big companies. I think that rather the smaller companies, the mid-sized companies, which are not as attractive to young people um, in, in, the, in Germany, for example, because they rather want to go to the bigger companies, that those companies, and they have been starting already attracting Spanish people, Italian young people to, to move over uh, and, and to join those companies. Unfortunately, I think Spain, and, and we have a factory in Spain, and I closed down one factory in Spain some years ago, uh, the, f the, the labor framework in Spain is not very attractive for employers and for industrial uh, workplaces. So, or they have to change uh, that. Unions are very, very uh, aggressive in, in, in Spain. Uh, or the young people will move out of Spain and then we will have a huge problem uh, as we have seen it in other states uh, in Europe before. Okay, you wanted to jump on, in. Yes, on the issue of, of manufacturing, I think one of the things that, that uh, the questioner's point was, which I, I think is well taken, is the issue that in manufacturing there is this, um, the generation of, of ingenuity that needs to be recognized. That it's not just creating products that we've never had before, it's also um, you know, the perfection of, of products. And a lot of that happens on the shop floor and that connectivity but with manufacturing. You know, we don't drive the cars uh, today that, that we had 10 years ago. They're not, we, they're not a totally new product, but they're, they're very new in the application of the product. That ingenuity does come from that. And I do think that, you know, back to, to um, uh, protecting our markets. In my, unbelievably, in, in my community, uh, we actually still make candles. Uh, and we had won a, a trade award against product dumping of candles, only to have uh, China begin to ship the wicks and the candles separately. And you know, we were faced with the issue of, well, is this really a candle? Should it be subject to the same um, <coughs> tariffs uh, for product dumping? And, and of course it should. I think there are ways in which we, we need to work together on uh, the unfair trade practices that unfairly um, undermine uh, the manufacturing that we do have, from which ingenuity comes. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on Nick's uh, question because I think it was very focused and, and, and quite on the mark, and that is uh, skills. And this is very important because in virtually all of our markets, there's a skills mismatch. And there are a lot of jobs which go begging because people don't have the skills uh, to fill some of those, and some of them are filled by people who come from other countries, which is certainly the case in, uh, in the United States. So what we need to do is do a far better job on training uh, people for the kind of skills that are needed for 21st century jobs, particularly young people, because the big scourge in our countries is that there's so many unemployed young people. And this is something that we've got to figure out how to address. And education, not just education through the schools, but training, vocational training, things like that, that Germany does quite well. We need to do and are attempting to do uh, much more effectively. So that, that's in part dealing with the unemployment issue um, for younger people and in part dealing with the skills issue. It's also for older people whose careers are cut short because their industries have been scaled down. They need to develop new skills in other areas. Much harder to, train, uh, to retrain someone at 50 or 55 than a kid who's 17 or 18. But we have to do this because there is this mismatch and because unemployment really does is corrosive of our economic and our democratic systems. The question of small and medium-sized enterprises came up. One of the areas in the United States that may be different from Europe is that we are seeing a large growth in small and medium-sized enterprises um, in, uh, traditionally. One of the problems is that, uh, that the rate of growth of, or the rate of decline of employment in the United States has really not changed that much during this downturn. What has changed during the downturn is the rate of growth of new companies or the rate of growth of expansion in employment in new and old companies. It's that expansion. We have a very fast-churning economy, and we always have uh, periods where we lose jobs and lose companies. 
where you need to create a lot of jobs and a lot of companies to offset that. And that has slowed down. It's beginning to pick up now. And a lot of younger people are starting their own companies. This happened in the Depression, too, when people lost jobs. It was a period of great innovation, television, for instance. So people do use periods where they're laid off or they can't get jobs to create new companies, innovative companies. We're seeing that happen again. But training is critical, and start ups of, of SMEs are, are very critical. The manufacturing sector, I do think one of the interesting things about the manufacturing sector, and I totally agree that it is an important bulwark in our economy. I think that is very important. And it's not just about new products. It's improving the production line. It's improving efficiency. I, and, and one of the things that links back to Nick's question is, I went to Detroit, and Detroit drove around the Volt. The Volt is this, uh, the new Chevy car that's a, sort of a hybrid car. Um, and uh, it, it, sorry to, I mean, it's, it's just one of many hybrid cars on the market. Yeah. But, but uh, <laughs> they are better ones out Yeah, that was, well, yeah, well. Um, but the interesting thing that the woman who's in charge of this plant, the plants in Hamtramck in Detroit, it's an old plant. You'd have thought it was one of these older plants that was going south or down. What they're seeing now is that a lot of young people see energy and see new technologies for transportation as areas in which they would like to become involved. So that the same people who were going to financial firms and Silicon Valley to deal with uh, the sort of the, the, the technologies of, of that period and Cupertino and places like that, they're still getting people, or Google, but more and more well-trained people. I was up at MIT. A lot of these people are going into the energy area and into the area of developing new batteries, new cars, electronic cars. So some of the, and, and, and venture capital also is going to this area. So I'm, I'm, I'm not totally pessimistic about our manufacturing sector, but it is, it's changing in a, in a modern way in the energy and the auto sectors and the smart grids that are being developed are very important. To the degree we can reduce dependence on imported energy and make our energy grids and our energy systems more effective, we do two things. We reduce the outflow of money that goes to pay for oil and gas. But the other thing is we make not only our energy sectors more effective, but the manufacturing companies that depend on energy are also uh, able to get cheaper, more reliable sources of energy. So, so creating new jobs in the manufacturing sector and improving our energy sectors altogether, I think, is a critical new element which makes the future very different from the past. Minister, do you want to take on that question of unemployment yeah. in Europe? Yeah. It's alarmingly high in many countries. The, this tremendously rich uh, city we are here in, uh, where I live okay. and where I work in the Brussels capital region, one of the richest parts of the world, the unemployment of uh, the, the youngsters here is above 20%, which is, of course, not only unacceptable as far as the waste of talent is concerned, but is also, like the other subject matter of the working poor, something that exists in my country much less than elsewhere. We are at about 4% of people that are working and that are poor. I know that in most of the countries it's double or, or, or thrice as, as high. These are not only unacceptable things when it comes to economic logic or in e economic sense, they are also, let's have a look at the riots that happened uh, in a very big city of, of Europe uh, not, not that long ago. Uh, they show that too, too big of inequality is also a source of not only economic but also societal problems. And I think we cannot manage a strategy without thinking about the impact of inequality on, uh, on how society functions. Uh, Europe has a strategy. When it comes to the EU 2020 strategy, the five axes uh, that are developed, they do not only concern participation to the labor market, they do not only concern uh, research and development, they also specifically say we want to get down the number of youngsters that that leave school without a diploma. So I am confident that as compared to the Lisbon strategy, which lacked in implementation tools, the new strategy, the EU 2020 strategy, is going to be more of a success thanks to the implementation tools. And that is one of the things I would like to say to, to the, the person that uh, started by saying to me, all these years you have been, you're making me feel old. Uh, 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 when I, when I talk to Herman van Rompuy, he says, old people that are people that are older than you. So in that respect, you never get too old. 
Um, but do I see in all these years, uh, do I see more confidence? I think that amongst the colleagues there is a big conviction that what we are doing now has a very high TINA uh, uh, quality. There is no alternative. I think that everybody understands that there was some kind of a hereditary sin when wanting to create a monetary union, a eurozone, without following up on all the conclusions, including, mon uh, including economic and political uh, framework. I think that when we're going to look back on history, we're going to say that these last months, these last years, were revolutionary. I honestly think that. If you look at the tremendous amount of sovereignty that in a way has been handed over when it comes to the economic governance instruments, the European semester, the two-pack, the six-pack, the golden rule, the, ma the, the, the monitoring on the macroeconomic imbalances, it's a tremendous set of tools that has profoundly changed the way in which the, the European member states, especially those who are in the Eurozone, uh, accept that their fate is, is linked to each other. Um, I think that when it comes to confidence, the people who are there with me in ECOFIN and in the Eurogroup, they do are confident that this is the road to be chosen, but one of the elements that is now somewhat worrying is all our parliaments have voted that, but did they really understand what they voted? Our, all our people say we want more Europe in a sense, but do they in their heart agree with everything which has to do with that? And that is the confidence issue today. It is not a lack of confidence, are we doing the right thing? But it is the confidence, are we going to be able to explain to our audiences that this is really the TINA, that this is the, th there is no alternative. And uh, speaking on behalf of somebody who is seven years in politics now and has had five campaigns, electoral campaigns, knowing that after uh, somewhat two years in office as a foreign minister, I was already in the picking order in, in, uh, in the number of, uh, of time that I spent as a Minister of Foreign Affairs with my 27 colleagues, I was in the top 10. When I explained this in Beijing to the, to the Chinese colleague, they, they, he, he started laughing. He said, is that the democratic system in which you, sw you switch your, your people at a, at a rate in which... So a lot of people uh, that are my colleagues, they are confident that we're doing the right thing. But the big issue is, are we going to be able to explain this to our people in a convincing fashion, in an honest fashion, that gives people not only hope, but also the conviction that this is the road to follow? All right, we're at the um, Twitter moment of proceedings, where uh, I'm going to ask for your interventions to be incredibly short and brief, and I'm going to ask uh, you to pick and choose the ones you want to answer without feeling you have to do everything. But let's try and get as many points of view in. Yes, sir. Thank you, Michael Maybach uh, with the European American Business Council. When the Treaty of Rome and John Kennedy uh, were around, uh, we had about one-third of GDP go, in, go to government and two-thirds of the private sector. Because of the declining demographics, rising welfare state, we now have in Europe and the United States almost half of the GDP in the, private sec uh, the pu public sector. Can we remain competitive in the West if we have half of the economy uh, controlled by the government? Okay, uh, yes, here. Oh, Valentin Abo from the Observer. To Mr. Van Acker, he mentioned that the uh, spreads have gone down uh, on, the, on the Belgian uh, uh, bonds. So my question is, do you then agree with the German argument that since markets seem to have gone down, there is no need for a bigger firewall? Um, we should just put the money that is needed instead of having this big firewall that would uh, fend off market attacks. Thank you. Thank you very much. You pass your microphone over there. Thanks very much. I'm Roland Freudenstein, Center for European Studies. And uh, uh, Minister Van Ackeren, I uh, want to follow up on the economic governance that you talked about. Uh, you know, now with the fiscal compact, uh, some people are saying this is just the beginning. We need a unified uh, social policy, unified uh, tax policy, at least in the Eurozone. There are other people who are saying this is going to de precisely destroy the diversity that has made us strong and competitive in the past. So, you know, my provocative question to you, how many jobs is a European finance minister going to kill? <laughs> okay, thank you for that. That counts as 140 characters, yes. Yeah. Uh, my question is to Mr. Hormatz. My name is Marcus Freitas, I'm from Brazil. And uh, you mentioned one thing that I thought was very interesting, which was the mismatch of skills. 
Brazil is a country that's facing a major shortage of workforce when it comes to skilled labor. Uh, what policies have been implemented in the US and in Europe that have been trying to address this issue of mismatch? Because that's a problem we have. OK, we I'm going to interrupt you there. Thank you. Anybody else? This is it. Speak now. Forever hold your tongue, please. <laughs> Let me take the, uh, the issue of the, the spending, because obviously that's something I had <coughs> said before. Uh, yes, absolutely, uh, government spending affects our competitiveness. Um, if you look at the United States, you know, our social spending, uh, Medicare, Social Security, all of those programs, uh, by equations, are, are not sustainable. Uh, therefore, they, they lower confidence um, in uh, you know, whether or not we're going to, to be able to sustain them. And they're important programs. They're pro programs that, not, that, that need to be reformed, not abandoned. Government spending is an issue of, of an area of reform, and, and we're going to have to get uh, to that business. OK. Uh, skills. Brazil. Yes, in Brazil. Yes. Actually, I have lived in Brazil, so I have some knowledge okay. of what, what happens there. And I think first you need to have a very good education system where, where first the young people, they go to school. And there are a lot of regions in Brazil, and I read this morning in the newspaper, that they have some very innovative, uh, not very recommendable, but things to, to make sure that, people, that the, the, the young people really go to school. And then, uh, as we do in Germany, you know, we have a very, uh, very well uh, developed system where companies and the, state, uh, the government together, we provide you know, uh, also um, uh, this vocational training for over three years. And you go to school and you also learn at, uh, you learn at uh, your, your company. So I think it's important that you have a, a joint effort of companies and government uh, to make sure that you get the right skills. And then you also will have the right match at the end. Bob? Yes, um, very quickly. First, uh, I just wanted to follow up on the minister's point in the last round. I do think he is exactly right that we have to convince public opinion that what we're doing is correct and make sure that they buy into this. If we don't do this, then uh, however brilliant the policies are, won't work. I mean, one of the geniuses of Franklin Roosevelt was that he didn't have real answers when he came into office. He closed all the banks. He said, when we open the banks, the banks will be fine. The banks, he reopened in a week. There was no possibility that he could analyze the banks to determine which were good ones and which were bad ones in a week. Uh, but he opened them up. And the fact that they believed in him and they believed that he had a set of policies to deal with this, people started putting their money back, back in the banks that they'd removed it. So confidence that you have a, a plan and the plan is going to lead to real answers that benefit people is critically important. If people don't believe that, even a perfect plan won't work. Uh, second point relates to Michael Maybach's point. Um, it is true that the more the governments uh, play a role in the economy, the greater the potential that the money will be used for transfer payments and things, and, and, and to some degree, perhaps not for investment. My, my view is that you do have certain countries that have a large portion of their GDP, in effect, in effect uh, driven by government, Scandinavia. And many of them are the most competitive countries in the world. So there are ways of, of having the government play a big role as long as the money that it does spend is used for productive purposes. And if it's all used for transfer payments or for boosting consumption, and, and too little of it is used for investing in the future, like education, infrastructure, a number of other things, energy, then, then it will, over a period of time, uh, reduce the potential uh, for, for competition. And uh, the skills, the, the, the broader skills issue, I think what we're trying to do, the, the, the Brazilian question is a very good one. You look in the Middle East, it's not that people are uneducated. They're very educated in Egypt, North Africa. They have some excellent universities. They're just not, just not educated for 21st century jobs. And one of the things we're trying to do is to help them through vocational training. And we ought to do the same thing at home. We need more emphasis on junior colleges, vocational schools, schools that, that treat the, 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 the job skill gap as something where the government can play a facilitating role uh, in training people for these new jobs. And the last is companies themselves uh, need to do more in the area of apprenticeship and working with people. The German companies have done this very well. I do think American companies in their own interest would benefit from doing that to a greater degree because then when the economy picks up after a downturn, they don't have to spend all this new money on training. They have workforce that's already 
uh, uh, knowledge, knowledgeable and trained. So I think some of it's on the burden, the burden of the governments, but the companies themselves should rethink their apprenticeship program and do courts arbeit themselves. Okay, uh, Minister. Well, I, I looked it up. Uh, the, the spread on 10 years yields for Belgium has been at 360 on the, on the 360 something uh, about a year ago is now at 120 something. So dropping by, by two thirds. But if you have a look at what happened to Portugal, we are at uh, the 14% has become 10%. And the 10% is still too much. So when, when talking about the firewall, it's not only about countries like my country feeling pretty much distant from firewalls uh, that uh, explains why there is a need for a European construction to have something that is a strong, convincing, credible firewall. So we will be continuing to defend the thesis that uh, explains that uh, we have to explain to, to those who want to speculate that no matter what, we're not going to let in, uh, give in. And then to the, the question on, on fiscal uh, harmonization, uh, I'm speaking as a Belgian politician as well. To a provocative question, uh, probably there needs to be a political answer. I do believe that uh, when talking about uh, these construction defaults that have existed once you sh you've chosen to, to be a, a monetary union, uh, there is a, a lack of, of seeing that you need to have uh, a level playing field when it comes to also uh, some of the, the taxation policies and at least when it comes to having a common corporate tax base I honestly think that we should move on and uh, leave of course some of the, the, the freedom uh, levels to individual states but at least have a, cor a common corporate tax base. Okay, thank you very, very much. We've covered a huge amount of ground and I'm grateful to the panel and to the audience for uh, all your questions. Thank you very much. And thank you, Anton. That was uh, really a great uh, discussion. We're now going to go to lunch. It's out in the lobby. You don't have to go downstairs, just around the corner. And uh, we're not back till 2.30. Thank you. <laughs>